Occasionally, someone will ask me, what is the most interesting thing that you own? I actually had a friend at my Thanksgiving party a couple days ago ask me outright, what is the weirdest thing you own? And I've had other people ask me, what's the most interesting? What's the, what's your favorite thing that you own out of all the stuff that you own? And it's always been a difficult question to answer because I like all this stuff. I find all of it fascinating and I, it's all weird. I wouldn't have it if it wasn't weird. That's a lie, but anyway. However, I can now answer the question, what is your favorite thing that you own? It's this, it's this thing. I've been wanting one of these for a long time. When I say favorite, what is favorite? I'm not sure if it's the most interesting thing that I own, honestly. It might not actually count as that, but what it is is, uh, I guess, the most quintessential thing that I own. Out of all the stuff that I own that represents something I'm interested in, some weird phenomenon, uh, some chunk of history that I admire or am just taken in by, this, I think, is the one that sort of encapsulates the most number of things in the purest form. I mean, I own some other stuff that sort of hits other marks, but there's, there's things that only this does. So I should probably tell you what it is. So this is a electronic news gathering camera. This is an entire category of equipment which exists to this day, as far as I know. It's uh, separate from everything else. It, you know, there's, these are devices that were made specifically for the thing they're made for. And you don't really find them as far as I know in anything other than the thing that they're made for. By electronic news gathering, we of course mean taking videos of burning buildings, taking videos of helicopter crashes, uh, taking videos of the cops gassing protesters, etc. Uh, these are electronic news gathering activities. It's when you are shooting video. That's pretty much what that means. So this is a device that's sort of purpose built for the needs of someone doing that thing. A uh, you know video journalist, somebody who's out with the local television station, you know, taking footage of something interesting that's going on. And this one is quite old. I probably obviously, I don't know. I mean, if you know anything about this industry, you could probably guess that it's old because you could probably guess that I don't have $16,000, which is what it would take to buy one of these now, as far as I know. I think this one, what was the MSRP? I've got, I can look this up. JVC KY210. Well, per JVC, MSRP was $66.95. However, an important thing to keep in mind is that was $66.95, no dot, in 1984 dollars? or possibly 1981, I'm not sure. Can't find a conclusive date when this thing was first sold, but anyway, it's from about that era. This thing is at least as old as the original Macintosh, okay? And it's several years older than me, to be sure. So in theory, this is what JVC thought somebody taking video of some news item would need in 1981 or 1984. And so its capabilities are quite specific. Now I've never worked in pro video, so I can't tell you how many of them are unique to this device. Could also be argued this thing is pretty bare bones as camcorders go, and I wouldn't disagree with that. It is, but its purpose was to capture, you know, didactic video, a realistic representation of something that happened. It's not meant to be a movie camera. At least that is my <sighs> assumption. See, I don't really know, and the reason I don't really know is because I didn't go to school for this. And I think, and I might be wrong, but I think that maybe no one does, that maybe no one actually knows this because of school, that possibly this is something you just learn about on the job. But just based on, you know, some of the information I can find online, I get the impression this is something that people just sort of know by rote. They know because they went and got a journalism degree, or they went and got some sort of technology degree and then went to work at a news station and someone showed them the ropes and that's how they learned how all of this works. Because I didn't do any of that, I'm sort of running on fumes. Um, I can't find a lot of really conclusive information about this category of equipment. I found a lot of like people on forums saying, you know, this works with this or this does this, but I can't find, you know, a web page with any reference information on it. You know, you can go to Wikipedia and get like list of Sony cameras and it'll just for some reason list off like every consumer Sony camera that, that exists anywhere. Well, you can't do that for these. There's no conclusive list of them. It's hard to find the manuals. It's hard to find information about when they were sold or how much they cost. I mean, they just sort of disappeared into the past. Most of the information I'm able to get is from like trade rags, you know, the sort of insider information magazines that are distributed to, you know, news organizations and that sort of thing. You know, going through them and, you know, looking up a specific model number allows me to go to Google Books and say, you know, okay, here's an article about the JVC KY210U from 1985, or someone's saying that it's a great up and coming value for the news station on the budget. Okay, well, that tells us that in 1985, 
it was pretty damn recent at least. It doesn't tell us when it came out or how much it cost, but it at least gives us a notion. So it's a lot of like running on that. So I've wanted to do a video about ENG cameras for a while because I've always been fascinated by them. These like bazooka rigs that you see on, you know, newsmen's shoulders when, you know, there's a big tornado or something like that. They always looked really interesting to me and I, I hate camcorders. This thing, like, I'm gonna do a video about this at some point because it's super cool, but I hate this thing. It's so, uh, it's just fiddly and plasticky and uh, there's no manual control. I just, I hate it. I love it, it's it's super cool. I love camcorders of all stripes. I just always love video, but there's just something about this that's, well, here. <clears throat> this weighs about 30 pounds. I don't know, maybe more, because this is all aluminum, all of it. I don't mean the panels. I mean all the way through, and it ain't a thin boy either. That's not plastic, that's painted aluminum. It might be magnesium, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll find out when I open it up. I will be opening it up, because there's actually some really interesting technological shit going on in here. And that's why I'm doing a video now, because I actually have several more cameras of this type, but they aren't as interesting as this one is. But I got this thing, and I just loved it so much that I could not resist. I had to do a video on it. So I'll give you the basics and I'll talk about this particular device. And then in the future, hopefully you'll see more about ENG cameras from me. For now, let's just enjoy this thing. I don't think I need to tell you the standard definition. Um, I mean, it's pretty good standard definition for the time, or at least it was, it's fallen terribly out of calibration, but it's, you know, 1984 shot television resolution. So I'm not gonna start shooting videos on this thing. It's worthless. It, it has no value at all. Uh, anyone who would pay money for one of these is only paying for it as a collector's item. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no use for these in 2018, make no mistake. But that doesn't mean it's poorly made or that it's not an impressive piece of equipment. I mean, it really is. One of the things I like about these is how modular they are. So I'll just go ahead and start there. So this microphone here is the biggest boom mic I've ever personally seen. And if you just unscrew this screw here, it comes right off. And you can see in this close-up shot that the spot where it slides in and screws down is actually a dovetail, you know, like something you'd see in a machine tool. And then when we turn the mic around, you see that it's using this almost custom connector. The whole thing is metal, every single piece of it. There's no plastic on here at all. I guess because they anticipated that newsmen might actually drop this thing while, you know, running from a tornado. Now, if we set this down and look at the mic in detail, this is theoretically the microphone. However, right here, this collar unscrews and it comes apart into adapter flange bracket and mic itself. And you'll notice that that connector and this connector are identical. My guess is that this same mic was such a good piece of equipment, they probably charged several hundred dollars for it. And when they switched from one camera model to another, or maybe they were selling multiple at the same time, they didn't want to make people buy a new microphone. So you could just probably buy this bracket alone. Another possibility is that there was a whole category of these mics that had a standard screw thread for attaching to brackets like this from JVC or maybe from all different manufacturers. Next, we have the viewfinder, which you'd think would be part of the camera, but you can take that off as well. You can see there's just a neat little six pin connector there that mates with another beautiful, I think, maybe even machine connector on this side. And look at this huge aluminum dovetail that holds it all together. Now, they didn't need to make this this well. The dovetail was uncalled for. How often are you gonna take this thing off and put it back on? The thing is though, it's entirely possible that they were expecting you to do that very often. In this category of equipment, the modularity of it appears to actually be quite practical. There may have been other viewfinders, or you might have taken this off and then slotted on a viewfinder that was like an entire five inch television. This was pretty common with this type of equipment. ENG cameras often have like four or five inch monitors on them for monitoring. And of course there's, you know, the notion that you might have had five of these as spares in the van, and if one broke because you dropped the camera or whatever, then you'd just pop it off and put another one on. You know, it just takes a little flathead screwdriver and five seconds. This, by the way, all of it, it's aluminum, the whole thing. By the way, if you know anything about old camcorders, you probably know this, but this is in itself a television. When I say television, I mean CRT television. So if you open this up and look inside, you'll see there's a gray screen in there. And if you tilt it a little, you can see that that screen is actually here and there's a mirror there. And the reason the screen is there 
is because all of this is a cathode ray tube. That is actually a little two inch, I don't know, inch and a half black and white television. Now that's not uncommon for this era. Even consumer camcorders had that. But this one is uncommonly large. Usually they were probably half the size of this. The actual tube in this is gigantic. Another modular element, of course, is the lens. Now, interchangeable lenses on a camera isn't all that exciting if you're used to still photography. And, of course, you know, cinema cameras can all do it. And I guess this isn't special if you're used to, you know, any kind of professional video equipment, but this is the most impressive thing I've ever owned, so it still just whacks me out. All this is the lens. I mean, look at the size of this thing. It's not small. All of that is lens. Look how much lens there is. And, I mean, it's not just lens, right? Like... You could tell that's a hand grip on the side, and it's attached to the lens, not to the camera. That is part of the lens. So that means the lens itself has got to be a real sturdy motherfucker if it's going to have that angular force on it all day long. So, you know, this has got to be quite a beast of a unit. By the way, if you'd noticed at any point just how big the lens cap is, I mean, it's a gigantic lens cap. Absolutely enormous. It's not actually because the lens is that big on the front. This here is a hood, a rubber hood. I don't actually know if it's collapsible like it is on some cameras, but you'd want to have this on there so it wouldn't flare from sunlight because you'd be shooting out stores in uncontrolled circumstances. So this isn't actually the size of the front element. The front element is quite a bit smaller, as you can see. It's a much more reasonable size, sort of a photo lens size. So that just comes off, but then it just doesn't look nearly as impressive. Still quite a unit, though. And indeed, I mean, look at this thing. This is from an era when they were still making lenses this way. You know, 35 millimeter photo lenses were also this beefy, but I mean, there's just so much more of it. Look at these screw on connectors. I'll tell you about those later. Look at the mechanical switch here. This is, this is, well, it's not an electrical switch. It's actually a mechanical switch. When you flip this, it changes the zoom from manual to, uh, I don't know what the, I don't know what the S stands for. Speed? If I go to zoom it with this ring, works just fine, but if I flip it to S mode, you can hear, maybe you can hear, it's trying to drive a motor in reverse there through a gear train, and that's because this lens, of course, has built-in power focus. You'll notice, by the way, this has an enormous range of motion, and that's because it's actually speed controlled. You can move either a little bit or a lot, very quickly or very slowly. More on the implications of that later. Functionality aside though, just look at what this is. That is a solid piece of machined aluminum. And when you move it, it has a little spring detent that forces it into position. It's just a, it feels so good to use. You could feel it snap from place to place. Now, another thing you might have noticed about this lens that's maybe unusual compared to you know photographic lenses you've seen is uh, this guy and uh, this guy. So these do a couple things. I'm gonna assume you know the basics of photography. If not, I'm sorry, I don't have time for a primer right now. Iris control, zoom control, focus control. The iris control, maybe you can hear that. There's a motor driving it. That's because this is a camcorder. So of course it has to have the ability to change the brightness level. Let me show you, by the way, what iris control looks like. Watch this. See right here where this metal's glinting? Observe. See that diamond shape? See it gets smaller? That was the shape of the iris. See, the iris is made out of two pieces of metal like this, and the camera just moves them like that to make the iris bigger or smaller. For some reason, that's how camcorders all seem to do it. Gibbs is in here, and he's perturbing my backdrop. Gibbs, I swear to God. I love you, Gibbs. You're a wonderful cat. And look at how barbarian this is. I mean, there's no real affordance given to this being one piece of equipment. Despite the fact that these were made for each other, this thing is just glommed on here with these screws. Just bracketed on, like, who cares? It looks like it's not supposed to be on there. It looks like an aftermarket accessory. I mean, hell, maybe it is. I happen to know that I could take these screws out, remove this whole thing, and just use this as a manual lens. So, who knows? Maybe this was available in a manual variant. Maybe you were supposed to be able to take this off and put a different one on. I have no idea how this shit works. Here, let's finish up with this lens. Here's the final control, and this thing's super wacky. I don't really fully understand it. This control, if you loosen the screw over here, you can swing this back and forth. This adjusts what's called back focus. I have no fucking clue what that does. All I know is it's sort of like you can adjust where infinity focuses on the lens. Like if I put it here, it seems to focus kind of past the sen sensor in the camera. 
Maybe that's because this is intended for use on different cameras and some have sensors in a different position than the other, so you have to adjust infinity. I don't know. What's interesting about this, though, is the same ring, once you tighten it down, it, it won't move. But these cameras all have macro bypasses, so if you pull on this little stud here, you can then move this a certain distance. And what that does is it adjusts the back focus to allow you to get super, super close to things. So basically all video camera lenses are not only like massive zooms, but they're also macro lenses. This is just always the case and everyone I've ever seen. The final fascinating thing here is the mount. This is the mount locking ring. This is a bayonet mount, just like a 35mm SLR would use, but you actually, it's like, um, I think called a breech, a breech mount, I want to say. Like the, I think the Canon AE-1 used this. It's basically, you, you rotate this ring instead of the lens to release it. Not sure what the advantages are. So I'm just going to unplug the lens over there. You can see there's another one of these beautiful multi-pin connectors used to plug the lens in. And then we just lift this bad boy off. Now the flange on these things, I mean, yeah, it looks like a bayonet mount, but you can tell immediately. It's kind of a meatier, more badass one. Here's the business end of the thing, and like, yeah, it looks like, you know, part of a nuclear reactor. This is the uh, very, very heavy aluminum collar. I mean, that's like three-eighths of an inch thick. And I mean, of course, look at all these screws. I think that's probably because this thing handles an enormous amount of torque, or um, sorry, that's not true, torsion, right? Bending force. This, of course, is where the image sensor is. Notice I didn't say CCD because it's not a CCD. It's not a CMOS either. It's something else entirely. This has a weird sort of um, dichroic look to it because inside there's three image sensors, red, green, and blue. That's pretty common in high-end videography equipment. And I'm pretty sure this is common as well. This over here, this little control, you can roll with your finger. And what it does is it rotates a turret that has built-in neutral density filters of different densities. There's also one that blocks the sensor completely. I'm not entirely sure why. Also on the front here, we have a VTR button. This is how you actually launch recording. Uh, the reason it's on here in this odd position is, be I guess, because since the camera is meant to be used with different lenses and the hand grip is on the lens, the manufacturer can't be entirely certain that there'll be a button on the lens for starting the recorder. So you've got a button on here so you can do it without needing a lens or without needing a specific lens. This here is the white balance control. You press up to tell it to set white to whatever you're currently looking at. And when you pull down, it shuts the iris so that the image is completely black and then sets the black level. I cannot figure out what level indicator does. I assume that it's for audio, but I can't get it to work. I have no idea what auto shift does. Now this is possibly one of my favorite things. You've got the bars gener the color bars generator here, and it has a molly cover. It's got like this aluminum flap. Hey, you know, this is this isn't aluminum. This is the only part of the entire thing that's not aluminum, I swear. It's just that. They even they even match the texture. It's exactly the same texture. Anyway, all this has inside of it is a, a switch, but it's a physical switch. Look at that. It's just like an off-the-shelf Radio Shack, you know, one of those little metal paddle selectors. Like I said, it's all just, it's barbarian. It's just made out of stone knives and bear skins. Got to get the lens back on here so it doesn't get too much dust inside it. Now around on the back side of this thing is the absolutely gigantic battery. You may have noticed it. Now, this battery is in itself quite a funky thing. The electricity doesn't actually connect through the mount like you'd think. It connects through this plug here. And then once that's unplugged, you can lift this off the mount. See, there's absolutely no contacts on there at all. Just a big fat power cable at the bottom. This, by the way, is a standard. I don't know if it's just ENG or if it's all professional video, but this uh, four pin XLR connector just provides 12 volts on the top two pins there. And that's how apparently everything in this industry is powered. I mean, they, a lot of them have battery connections as well. This one's kind of unusual and not appearing to have one at all, but they all seem to have this. Looking at the back, I don't actually see any contacts. So I think that this thing really doesn't have any way to attach a battery other than by plugging in the cable. Now, mind you, I think a big reason for that is this was meant to be used with a huge external battery pack, not necessarily a battery on the back, but just a cable here going off to a great big gigantic battery pack somewhere else. And the reason for that is this thing is partially intended to be used 
with an umbilical. There's 14 pins in here, and as far as I can tell, if you look up circular 14 pin connector, you'll get this exact device. It appears to be some kind of standard. I don't know what it's called, but that search phrase does seem to get it, and they're still made today. Additionally, I looked on the side of my Panasonic SVHS professional deck, and it seems to have this same connector. So I suspect this was a de facto industry standard, but I can't find any information about it at all. I mean, JVC is just like, plug this into your JVC VTR. If other VTRs work, I mean, who knows? The idea here is these pins are probably like component video, composite video, maybe RGB on some models, I don't know, and then remote record signal to tell the videotape recorder to start rolling. Also, audio output and input pins. Why input? Well, obviously, if you have the microphone on here, or if you have an auxiliary mic plugged in via XLR, you're going to want audio to come out of here to the recording apparatus. But if you have a studio situation, or you have like a remote, you know, command vehicle with somebody in it who's monitoring the whole situation, they might want to tell the camera operator what to do. So on the back here, there's this jack, which says earphone. I initially thought that this was so you could hear what the mic was picking up, but it doesn't actually come out of here. This is for your, you know, commanding officer back in the studio car, uh, back in the transmitter van to say, hey man, you know, pan up a little bit. You're not quite getting it. You're falling asleep at the wheel. And I mean, that should make the point, if you haven't noticed it, this thing can't record. It has no recording capability. It's just a camera. The, you're supposed to hook this um, you know, gigantic umbilical connector here up to a remote videotape recorder or you know, digital recorder or whatever you got and record the video back there. This thing is just the camera itself. That's what fascinates me so much about this type of equipment. This thing was not meant to be used by itself. You didn't go out and shoot you know, footage on something entirely in this thing. You shot it with the help of a crew. You had somebody back in the van, you know, transmitting the video and doing the engineering work. Uh, maybe even somebody, you know, directing what you were shooting. Um, you were just there being the camera, but you were part of this great big operation, this, this you know, crew. So all the affordances for that and the things that aren't here because of that, is, they're all fascinating to me. This thing has very little in it other than the ability to shoot video and to see what you're shooting, and that's it. Everything else... All the affordances you'd expect from a camcorder, they're not here. This thing is pure business. Every single square inch of it is meant to accomplish a goal. There's no fun. There's no effects. It just shoots video. That's all it does. One of my favorite things about this is how much hidden stuff there is. I mean, I mean, you saw they had the bars controlled behind that little flap. Well, look at this. There's a flap here that's just got a whole bunch of little switches in it. And as far as I can tell, these are for generating test signals. See, there's this test output here. As far as I can tell... That outputs some sort of like baseband, like raw red, green, blue channel so that you can see what's actually being picked up and like calibrate that channel. The fact that they have like, you know, a diagnostic and calibration output just hanging out the side at all times is just incredible to me. And here on the back, after you take the battery off, it reveals this. There's a little panel back here. When you take the screw out, it reveals some sort of nightmare multi-pin connector. No idea what that thing does. This is, again, a little aluminum flap. Incredible build quality. Now, I told you this thing was unusual. Now I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. Let's go ahead and get the side panel off. I took off the wrong side panel, so now I'm gonna take off the right one. Bet you've never seen a camcorder built like this. The whole thing is a mainframe. These are plug-in cards. You can actually pull these out. And it's all calibratable. These are all calibrators. Gosh, this thing's absolutely buried. I, I was positive I could get in there to show you. See, this thing actually predates the CCD. It does not have a solid-state image sensor because while they had been invented, they had not really become commercially available yet. In 1984, they were still just around the corner. So it turns out, I misremembered, I can't show you how this thing senses the image. But as a booby prize, I'm going to show you how it works in another camera that works exactly the same way. So give me just a second. Obviously, I'm going to do a video on this one too eventually, but not right now. It's hard to get a straight angle on this thing, but it kind of looks like the flux capacitor. These are very late model video tubes. They're vacuum tubes used to capture images. These were used for the first, I don't know, 70 years of television. 
and there's three of them here. You can see there's one going up into that weird black hump on top. One for red, one for green, one for blue. And the black thing they're all going into is a color splitter. It's a prism assembly. It splits the signal out so each one gets one of the three colors. Everything else in here is the support circuitry to drive it. So that's why the other camera is so big despite only being a camera with no recorder. It needs all of this to make those three tubes go. That includes high voltage, high frequency, synchronization, everything you'd expect from a high-end television, times three packed into one camera, just in order to make a picture. Things were wild in 1984. After all that explanation, what you probably really want to know is what does it look like? What's the video look like? Well, I'll show you that next time. No, seriously, I'm going to put up another video very shortly with a bunch of footage from both in here and some I shot in the field and some demonstrations, some of the effects, because there's actually a lot more to talk about as far as how this thing actually functions. It's got some really weird features I'd like to show you. But to me, this thing is equally or more valuable as an object of beauty and of intrigue than as one of actual functionality. Hell, the huge one I just opened up to show you the insides, it doesn't even work. I have these things because they're cool, not because they're going to necessarily serve a purpose. Of course, I can shoot vaporwave as hell videos with this, so I guess that is a purpose. But check back very soon to see the denouement of this. And otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed showing it to you. Look out for more videos about video from me in the future. I sure as hell have enough equipment to show you. This is a huge passion of mine. It's honestly why I wanted to start doing video in the first place, is I just love video. So keep an eye out for those. Thanks for joining me. Have a nice night.